To my YouTube listeners, if you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, please subscribe. It'll make a big difference for the Hasidic Story Project. Shalom Aleichem, my sweetest friends. It's now Cholom Oed Pesach. And let me tell you, the light coming down here in the holy city of Jerusalem is so beautiful and sweet. I had this vision before Pesach started that I would put together all of the stories that I've recorded in the past about Pesach. But of course, as I'm sure you know, the cleaning took more time than I thought, and so did the cooking. And so here I am in the intermediary days of the holiday. And if you happen to be listening to this episode after the holiday of Pesach is over, please continue listening because the Pesach stories are some of the best stories on the podcast. So I'm going to share with you all of the stories besides last week's that I have connected to the holiday. I hope you enjoy your holiday and you enjoy the stories. This is the Hasidic Story Project with Barack Holman, podcasting from Jerusalem, Israel. This podcast is sponsored by listeners just like you. To become a supporter of this podcast, please go to HasidicStory.com. H-A-S-I-D-I-C Story.com. You'll never know. You'll never know. You'll never know. You'll never know. It was a regular weekday night, and the Holy Rebbe, the after Rav called his Hasidim together to make a little verbrengen and have a feast, a little feast. The Hasidim were always happy to have a feast with their Rebbe, but eventually they wanted to know, so Rebbe, what's this feast about? And here's the story that the after Rav told. Many years ago, there was a wealthy Jew who decided that he was going to take half of his fortune and invest it in a kosher Eliyahu and the cup for Elijah the prophet that everybody uses at the Seder on Seder night. This was a magnificent cup with diamonds on it and a gold rim made out of a beautiful silver. He really put a lot of his heart and soul into it and a great deal of his fortune into it. And he and his wife decided that they were going to use it for the Seder. They used it the first year for the Seder, but unfortunately, by the time the second year came around, they had lost all of their money. The husband said to his wife, we have to sell the kosher Eliyahu, Elijah's cup. And the wife said, what are you talking about? We're not going to sell the cup. It's not even our cup. It's Elijah's cup. We can't sell it. He said, well, it's very nice to have this cup, but what's the cup worth if we don't have a Seder? We can't even afford to buy matzah, wine, food, anything. So we're going to have this big cup on the table and nothing else? The wife said, nothing doing. We're not selling the cup. It's Elijah's cup. They went back and forth, and now it's the morning of the Seder, just before the holiday starts. And the husband says to his wife, no, come on, let's sell the cup. And she said, it's not our to sell. He said, fine, well, we don't have anything at home. So I'm going off to shul. The husband went off to shul, and the wife started cleaning the house. There was nothing to do anyhow. She put a nice tablecloth on the table, put a few plates on the table and some silverware, and just waited for a miracle to happen. And just then, there was a knock on the door. The wife goes and answers, and there's this very distinguished-looking gentleman, obviously a Jew, standing there, and he says, My lady, I came to be with you and your holy husband for the Seder. She said, well, that's very nice. We'd love to host you, but we don't have any money and we don't have any food for the Seder. We don't even have matzot. The wealthy man said, that's not a problem. And he drops a little bag of gold coins on the table. He said to the woman, please go to the marketplace and buy everything you need. Buy it quickly so that we'll have everything in time for the Seder. I'm going to go off to shul and I'll be back here in time for the Seder. So the wife runs off and she buys everything she needs, prepares the food. She has this beautiful feast. And her husband comes home from shul. He comes home really late because he didn't expect anything to be at home. And he sees the house is lit up with candles and there's this incredible smell of the food. And he walks in and he sees a table fit for a king. He says to his wife, how did you do that? And of course, in the middle of the table is still the cup of Eliyahu and Avi. He said, how did you do that? And she said, well, you won't believe it. Just when you left, this wealthy man knocked on the door. He gave me all this money and he said, he's going to come here for the Seder. So the husband said, no, let's start. It's already late at night and I'm starving. The wife said, nope, we have to wait for the wealthy man to come. Waiting, waiting, waiting. It's already getting later. Now it's 20 minutes before midnight, and everybody knows you have to finish the Afikoman before midnight. So they quickly go through the Seder, and they start the meal. And when they finally get to the point where they're supposed to invite the Avi to come in and drink from the cup, the husband tries to get up from his chair, but he's so tired, he puts his head down on the table and falls asleep. And as soon as he falls asleep, there's a knock at the door. The wife goes and answers the door. And who's standing there? None other than the wealthy man. The wife says, Ah, where have you been? We've been waiting for you for so long. He said, My lady, you don't know who I am. I'm Eliyahu Navi, And because you didn't want to sell my cup, you merited that I would come to your Seder. And so he comes in, 
and he drinks from his cup. And she says to him, but what about my husband? And the Onavi says, well, he wanted to sell my cup, so he doesn't get to see me. And the two of them spend some time together learning some Torah. And the woman asked for blessings for her husband and her family. And then Eliyahu Navi left, and the husband woke up. The husband said, I don't know what came over me. I don't know why I'm so tired all of a sudden. But now I should get up and open the door for Eliyahu Navi. The wife said, ah, too late. He already came. The husband said, what do you mean he already came? And she explained to them the whole story, and how since she didn't want to sell the cup, she married to see Eliyahu Navi. The years passed, and eventually the husband left this world. He was called up to the holy Beit Din upstairs the court upstairs, and he was judged for his actions in this world. He lived a life of Torah and mitzvot, so they said, you're going into heaven, you're going to Gan Eden. But standing at the gate was Eliyahu Navi, and Eliyahu Navi said, not while I'm here. For somebody to go into heaven, you have to have at least enough belief in Eliyahu Navi. And if you don't believe in me, then you don't deserve to go to heaven. So the Beit Din didn't know what to do. They said, on the one hand, he's not guilty because he didn't do things wrong, he did things right. And on the other hand, Eliyahu Navi won't let him in. So they made him sit outside the gate. Four years later, the Rebbetzin passes away. And she gets up to heaven and all the tzaddikim and all the, the great prophets. And Eliyahu Navi himself comes to escort her into heaven. And she says, where's my husband? How come everybody came to escort me and my husband's not here? Where is he? What's going on? So they said, oh, no, no, don't worry about him. He's doing fine. She said, I am worried. I want to know where's my husband. So eventually she understood that Eliyahu Navi wasn't going to let him in. And she said, well, if he's not going in, I'm going to stay with him. And so she went and planted herself outside of the gate. And the two of them sat there for many, many years. And this is, of course, the Aptarav telling the story. And the Aptarav says, Just the other day I saw Eliyahu Navi. And I said to him, Eliyahu, isn't it time you let that couple in? And Eliyahu promised me that yes, enough time had passed. And because I requested, today he was going to let them in. And so that's why I'm making the feast of That's why I'm having this Fibrengen together with you, Hasidim in order to welcome the holy couple, finally, into Gan Eden. There was a chassid of the Hele Gebal Shem Tov who came to his Rebbe and he said, Rebbe, I want the merit of seeing Eliyahu Navi, Elijah the prophet, at the Seder on the night of Pesach. So the Rebbe closed his eyes and he thought for a minute and he said, okay, you will merit to see Eliyahu Navi at the Seder. However, it won't be here in Mezhibuz. He gave him some money. He said, I want you to buy all the food you need for the Seder, buy candles, buy clothes for a whole family, buy everything that you would possibly need for the Seder and for the days of Chag. And you're going to travel several hours from here to the end of this village. And he mentions the name of the village. He says, go all the way to the end of town and you'll see there's a broken down house. Go there and spend the Seders there. And I promise you, you will see Eliyahu Navi. And so this Chassid does what the Baal Shem Tov told him. He goes and buys everything for the Seder, including candles and clothes for a whole family, packs up the wagon, and travels several hours away. And he reaches this rundown house at the end of the village, just like the Baal Shem Tov said, and he knocks on the door. And a woman answers, and next to her a bunch of little children, dirty and dressed in ragged clothes. And the chassid says, my dear lady, I was sent here by my Rebbe to be with you for the seders. Would it be okay if I spend the seders here with you? 
And she said, yes, of course. The only problem is that we don't have any money and we don't really even have any food for the Seder. And then he points to the wagon that he brought. It's filled with matzot and bottles of wine and everything that you could possibly need for the Seder. And not just that, candles for the house and clothes for all the children. And the children ran to the wagon and started pulling things off. And they say to their mother, Mama, is this for us? And the mother looks at the chassid and the chassid is nodding his head saying, Yeah, yeah, it's for the kids, it's for all of you. And she says, Yes, children, it's for you. And miraculously, each child found the exact clothes that fit them. And the mother began preparing the meal for the Seder. And later on, the father came home and he seized all this wonderful stuff that the chassid had brought. And he said, what are you doing here? What, what is all this? The chassid said, my Rebbe sent me here. He said, I should come here for the Seders. And the father was very happy. And they had the two Seders. And the whole time, the chassid is sitting on the edge of his seat, waiting to see Eliyahu Navi. But both Seders pass, and nobody else entered the house besides the family and the chassid. Not even a stray cat or a dog or anything. <coughs> the seders were over, and now it was Cholam Oed, the intermediary days of the holiday of Passover. And the chassid jumped on his horse and wagon and raced back to the Baal Shem Tov. He said, Rebbe, I did everything you said. but all the food, clothes, candles, matzot, wine, everything. I brought it to the sweet family. We had a beautiful seder. And I'm telling you, Rebbe, I was looking, and I didn't see Eliyahu Navi. So the Baal Shem Tov closes his eyes and he thinks for a minute and he says, Hmm, are you sure that you didn't see Eliyahu Navi? Because I guarantee you he was there. The Chassid said, Rebbe, believe me, I had my eyes open the whole time and no one else was there besides me and the family. I didn't see Eliyahu Navi. So the Rebbe said, okay, here's what you're going to do. Here's some more money and you're going to buy enough food for the last two days of Yom Tov. Get some more candles as well and maybe a little bit more clothes for the kids and the father and the mother. And so the chassid goes and he buys everything, wine, food, clothes, candles. And he comes back to the Baal Shem Tov and he says, Rebbe, take a look at the wagon. Do I have everything? And the Baal Shem Tov says, yes. Now, before you go back, I want you to go into the mikvah and prepare yourself to see Eliyahu Navi. So the chassid goes to the mikvah. He gets back on the wagon and he heads back for the last two days of Yom Tov. And he's so excited because the Baal Shem Tov promised him that he would see Eliyahu Navi. And he even told him that the first time he was there, Eliyahu Navi was there. But for some reason, the Chassid didn't see him. But now he would. And so the ride, which was actually many hours, felt like it only took a few minutes. And he arrives at the house, the broken down house of this poor family that had nothing. And he goes to the door and he's about to knock on the door to say that he's there to spend the last two days of Yom Tov with the family. And he hears the children, and they're crying out to their mother. And they say, Mama, Mama, what are we going to eat? We don't have any food left from the Seder or the days of Cholom Moed. What are we going to eat on the last two days of Pesach? And the mother says to the children, Children, have faith. Just like when Eliyahu Navi showed up here to bring us the food for the Seder, I guarantee you, Eliyahu Navi will be back to bring us the food for the last two days of Yom Tov. And at that moment, the chassid understood that for that family, at that time, he was their Eliyahu Navi. And sometimes you're Eliyahu Navi, and sometimes I'm Eliyahu Navi. And we're Eliyahu Navi for one another. And when you find yourself down and out, and you think that you can't go on, I want to bless you, and you bless me back, please, that Hashem will send you Eliyahu Navi to keep you going one more day. It was the beginning of World War II, and the Skulana Rebbe was living in Chernovitz at the time. The situation was dire. There was hardly any food, and for sure, there was no matzah. There was even hardly any flour. But somehow, someone close to the Skulina Rebbe got a hold of a sack of flour. Now, the flour wasn't kosher for Pesach, but the Skulina Rebbe said, this is the flour that he's using to bake his own matzahs. He's going to bake matzahs for everyone in the community, and everyone will get three matzahs to be used for the Seder. The Viznitsha Rebbe, he heard that the Skulina Rebbe was baking matzahs, and of course, in Viznitsa, there was also a shortage of everything, and there were no matzahs. When the Vizincha Rebbe heard about this, he told his son, I want you to go to the Skulena Rebbe and get us six matzahs. The son, he looks at his father and he said, but father, everyone's getting three. 
and you know that there's a shortage. You want me to go and get six? He said, yes, you have to go get six. Go to the school in a Rebbe, and if he gives you a hard time, you tell him that you're doing the mitzvah of kibud av. You're doing the commandment of honoring your father. And I'm giving you an order. Go bring us six matzot, six matzahs. So the son of the Vizn Sherebi, he goes to the Skuliner, and the Skuliner is baking the matzahs himself with his own hands. Of course, the Hasidim are rolling them out, but he's the baker, standing there at the oven, putting the matzahs in and taking the matzahs out and inspecting them as they come out, making sure that everything is kosher. And the son of the Vizn Sherebi, he comes to the Skuliner, and he says, my father sent me here. The Skuliner says, it's quite an honor to have the son of the Vizn Sherebi. Shalom Aleichem, Aleichem Shalom. The son says, my father asked me to get six matzot. And the skuliner says, but my son, we're giving everyone three. He said, my father told me, if you give me a hard time to tell you that I'm doing the mitzvah of kibodav, that I'm doing the mitzvah of honoring my father, and he asked for six matzot. So the skuliner, he thinks for a second, and he says, all right, because your father gave you an order, because it's the mitzvah of honoring your father, and I wouldn't want you to disrespect that. I'm going to give you six matzot, and I hope you use them for a good purpose. So the son bowed his head. He was very grateful. He said to the schooliner, I'm sorry, Rebbe, I'm sorry that I had to ask for six. I don't really understand why my father wanted me to do this. But he insisted, and thank you very much. The schooliner, he takes a box, he puts the six matzahs in it, he wraps, his, wraps it up, gives it to the son of the vision to Rebbe, and the son returns home to his father. When he gets back, his father takes three of the matzot and puts them on the side. And another three, he puts them in a separate box. And a few days later, it's now Erev Pesach. It's now the afternoon where that night, it's going to be the holiday of Passover. And the Vizn Sherebi, he turns to his son and he says, I want you to go back to the Skulina Rebbe. We need three more matzot. The son, he looks like he's going to die on the spot. He says to his father, Please, Tati, don't make me do that. It was so embarrassing the first time to ask for six matzot. How am I going to ask him for three more? I mean, nine matzot, that's really chutzpah. The father said, listen, I'm giving you an order. You go and you get three more matzot. And then he hands his son a package. He says, no matter what the Skulina Rebbe answers you, whether he gives you matzot or not, whatever he says to you, regardless, you give him this package from me. So the son takes the package, and he goes back to the Skulina Rebbe's house and knocks on the door, and the Skulina Rebbe is a little surprised to see the son of the Vizincha Rebbe. And he says, Shalom Aleichem, Aleichem Shalom. What can I do for you, my son? And the son, he's really embarrassed. He's really embarrassed. He doesn't even want to say anything. The Skulina says, no, 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 tell me, what do you need? Please, whatever it is, I'll, if I can help, I'll, I'll help you. The son says, Rebbe, I'm so sorry. My father sent me here, and he asked me to ask you for three more matzot. I know, I know, I know, I know. I'm just so sorry. But he asked me, and maybe you have more matzot? The Skulina Rebbe, he looks like he's going to cry. He said, my son, I baked all these matzot and I gave them to everyone. I gave you six. There was one family, they didn't have anything. I gave them one matzah. And then another family, I gave them another matzah. Before I knew it, I had given away all of my own matzot. Not only do I not have any more matzot for you, I don't even have any matzot left for me, for my Seder. So I'm very sorry, my son. As much as I would love to give you three more matzot, I simply don't have them. I don't even have for myself. So the son of the Vision Sherebi, he said, thank you. And my father said, no matter what you answer him, to give you this package. And the son hands over the package to the Skulina Rebbe. Skulina Rebbe, he's curious. He slowly unwraps the box. And inside he sees there are three matzot that he baked with his own hands. You see, the Vizn Sherebi, he knew that the Skuliner was a tzaddik and would give the shirt off of his back to help another Jew. And he wouldn't be able to hold on to those last three matzot for himself. The Vizn Sherebi knew this because he would have done the same thing. So that's why he sent his son to get six matzot, three for their family, and three to return to the Skuliner Rebbe, Erev Pesach, the evening before the holiday so that he himself would have three matzot for his seder.
The Holy Rebbe, Reb Naftali Rapshitzer, was once a follower of Reb Mordechai of Neshchiz. Now, everybody knows that a chassid always wants to spend the holidays with their Rebbe. And so the Rapshitzer would always go to the Neshchizer for all of the holidays. One year, Reb Naftali is about to leave after Purim, and Reb Mordechai, his Rebbe, calls him over and says, Do me a favor, Naftali, don't come back here for Pesach. And Reb Naftali, he's shocked, he doesn't understand. He says, what, I'm not going to be with my Rebbe for Pesach? There's no way. But he figured, since Pesach was still four weeks away, he had time to figure out a plan that would get him invited back for the holiday. And so Reb Naftali gave it some thought, and he came up with a plan. A few days before Pesach, he returned to Neshchiz, and went straight to the kitchen of the Rebbetzin, because he knew that thousands of people were going to be coming for Pesach, and the Rebbetzin could use all the help that she could get. Reb Naftali worked in the kitchen and made himself indispensable to Reb Mordechai's wife. And then after several days of working, he said to her, It was such a pleasure working for you, and I can't stop thinking how beautiful and special and holy it would be if I could be here for the holiday of Pesach. I just wish I could be here with you. And the Rebetzin, she looks at him and says, What are you talking about? You're always here for all the holidays. Well, this year, your husband, the Rebbe, he made it clear to me that he doesn't want me around. I'm going to really miss him. And you know, it's so important to me. Maybe you could maybe ask him if it would be okay if I was here for the Seder? And the Rebetzin understood the hint. So she went to her husband and she said, I mamish need Reb Naftali's help for the Seder. He was such a big help in all the preparations. Please, you have to let him stay. And so the Rebbe, her husband, he said, all right, I got it. If it means so much to you, he can stay. But I'm warning you right now. He's going to make a lot of trouble for me. The morning before Pesach, the whole community got together and they burned all of their chametz, all of their leavened products, bread, crackers, whatever they had around. And you know, when we're burning the chametz before Pesach, we're not just burning bread. We're really wiping out all of the evil in the world and all of the bad things within ourselves. We're scouring the pot and cleaning ourselves out to the deepest depths of our being. And after all the chametz was burned, the rapshatzer, he really felt cleaned. And he went to the mikvah, and he put on his beautiful clothes for the seder. And then he went to the Beit Midrash, to the house of study, in order to learn. And he's sitting there, totally engrossed in his studying, when all of a sudden, he smelled this horrible smell. He looks around, and he sees that there's a schlepper, a poor and ragged, dirty Jew, who had just come in, into the Beit Midrash. And he really smelled bad. The Rapshitzer, he was on a very high level, and he had the ability to distinguish between a good smell and a bad one. And this man, he smelled really, really bad. It wasn't just a physical smell, it was a spiritual smell. It was like he had just done every transgression in the world, and he was just looking for the last transgressions he might have missed in order to do them. The schlepper comes over to Reb Naftali and he says, I've come to see the Rebbe. It took all of the Rapshitzer's strength not to hold his nose against the smell. And he thought to himself, there's no way I'm going to let this guy see the Rebbe. My Rebbe, he just cleaned himself and the whole world of every trace of evil. And now this disgusting, smelly schlepper, he wants to ruin all that by being in the presence of the Rebbe? No way. So he said to the schlepper, there's no way in the world I'm taking you to the Rebbe in the condition you're in. You stink, not just physically. I can smell all the transgressions you've done. Your mom is disgusting. Go home, take a bath, burn your chametz, do tshuva, repent for all the wrong things you did, then maybe come back, and maybe I'll let you see the Rebbe. But the way you are now, how do you even have the chutzpah to think of being in the presence of our holy Rebbe? And without another word, the schlepper turned around and walked out of the Beit Midrash. And the Rapshitzer, he went back to his learning, forgetting about the whole thing as if it didn't happen. A few minutes later, the door to the Beit Midrash bursts open. The Rebbe is standing in the room. He looks at Reb Naftali and he says, Did anyone just come in here? And he was almost out of breath from running into the Beit Midrash. And the Rebbe, he seemed really anxious. He seemed really on edge. But Naftali didn't even notice and he said, Eh, nobody that would be worth mentioning to you. The Rebbe looked at Reb Naftali angrily. I didn't ask you if there was anyone who you thought was worth knowing. I asked you, and I'm asking you again, did anyone, anyone at all, 
just come into this Beit Midrash. Reb Naftali still didn't get it. He said, well, you know, now that you mention it, there was this disgusting schlepper who had such a disgusting smell, and he was such a disgusting person. The Rebbe was besides himself. Gewalt! I knew this would happen. That's why I told you you couldn't be here for Pesach. What did you do? What was I supposed to do? Let somebody like that be in the presence of the Rebbe? There's no way, so I threw him out. Now the Rebbe's face was burning with rage. He was so angry that his voice quivered. He looked at the Rapshatzer right in the eye and he said, If you don't find me that man and bring him back to me, I never want to see you again. The Rapshatzer, he didn't understand what's going on. All he wanted to do was protect the Holy Rebbe. I mean, was that such a bad thing? But he thought he's going to lose his Rebbe over this. And he didn't even understand what was going on. He ran out of the Beit Midrash. He ran all over the city looking for the Schlepper. And finally, he found him in the local tavern, completely drunk. If he thought that he smelled before, he smelled a lot worse now. And he looked worse than he had before. But this time, Reb Naftali spoke with him with such respect, as if he were the holiest person in the world. My sweetest friend, please forgive me the way I treated you. I'm so sorry. I wasn't paying attention, really. Please come back with me to the Holy Rebbe now. I'll personally take you to see him. But the schlepper didn't even lift up his eyes to look at Reb Naftali. He didn't want anything to do with somebody who had insulted him like that. And for sure he wasn't going anywhere with Reb Naftali. So he ignored him and went back to his drinking. Reb Naftali tried again, listen, my sweetest friend, let me tell you the truth. The Helege, Reb Mordechai, my Rebbe, he really wants to see you. And he's so angry at me for kicking you out. If I don't bring you back, he'll never speak with me again. So please, I'm begging you, please come back with me. But the schlepper, he wouldn't budge. So the Rapschitzer had no choice. He was a big guy. And he picked up the schlepper, despite the smell, despite his bad feelings towards him, put him over his shoulder and carried him all the way back to the Rebbe. The Rebbe was overjoyed to see the schlepper. He hugged him and kissed him. And he said, where have you been? I've been waiting for you for so long. Gewalt, am I happy to see you. And suddenly he remembered that Reb Naftali was also standing there. But if Reb Naftali expected the Rebbe to thank him, he was mistaken. The Rebbe said to him, you can go now. And then he put his arm around the schlepper and led him into his house. All Pesach, the Rebbe was so cold and distant to Reb Naftali. But the schlepper, he was always by the Rebbe's side. And he looked like a totally different person because he'd taken a bath, gone to the mikvah, and was wearing a new bekeshe, a new silk robe, and a beautiful strimal. He was mamish shining from one end of the world to the other. When Pesach was over, the Rebbe calls Reb Naftali into his private room. All right, Naftali, I'm going to explain to you what happened here. You see, this man was not always a disgusting schlepper. As a matter of fact, he used to be my top student. What a level he was on. His learning, his character traits, his davening. He himself could have been a great Rebbe, but he's only human, just like all of us. And sadly enough, once he made a big mistake, he knew that I was aware of what he'd done and he was so ashamed to be in my presence. So he left my court without saying a word and never had the courage to come back. And after that, it was just downhill all the way for him. He figured he'd done one transgression, what, why not do another, and another, and another. Time went by, but I never stopped thinking about this student. And on Purim, I davened all day that Hashem should bring him back to me just for one moment. And the master of the universe, he had compassion on me. And I saw with my prophetic vision that he would come here the day before Pesach. But I also saw that you would be learning in the Beit Midrash when he arrived, and that you would throw him out. I knew that when this man decided to come to me, he considered it his last chance. He thought, if the Holy Rebbe accepts me without saying anything about what I did in the past, that will be my sign that my transgressions have been forgiven in heaven, and I'll stay by the Rebbe. But if any of us Hasidim judge me harshly and send me away, I'll know that in heaven, I'm still guilty. I'll leave the Rebbe's court and never come back again. And that's why I told you, Reb Naftali, that you can't be here for Pesach. I wanted you out of the way. And now you understand why. 
You were so quick to judge the schlepper. You almost robbed this person of the chance that Hashem gave him to be whole again. You know, my sweetest friends, we always have to be so careful. Many times when we meet people and we don't like the way they look, we don't like the way they smell, we want to turn them away. But instead, we have to welcome everyone with an open heart and open hands. And say, my sweetest friend, I'm so happy to see you. Because when you meet someone, you'll never know. It might be his last chance for that person to come back. This is a story that the great Rebbe, Reb Tzvi Elimelech, the din of a Rebbe, and the Bnei Yisachar, told about his father, Reb Feivel. In those days, Jews were so poor, they didn't have a lot of ways of making money. And one of the ways for a Torah scholar to make a living was to be a tutor in a rich Jew's house. The way it would work is that they would teach the children of the wealthy Jew from Sukkot until Pesach, make a few hundred rubles, and that was enough for them to live the entire year. So, the father of Rev Tzvi Elimelech, Reb Feivel, he became a tutor for a wealthy Jew. And the first Shabbos that he's there, Reb Feivel, he looks around, and he sees there are no guests. He says to the wealthy man, how can you have a Shabbos without guests? And the wealthy Jew says, what do you think? I'm wealthy because I waste my money on guests? I would never waste my precious money on hosting guests. Reb Feivel was so innocent. He said, listen, do me a favor. Just take it off of my salary. There's no way I can have Shabbos without poor people at the table. So take it off my salary and invite some poor people to your table. So the wealthy man said, sure, whatever you want. And Reb Feivel stayed there from Sukkot until Pesach. A few days before Pesach, he walks into the room of the wealthy Jew. And he says, okay, I've served you for six months. Now give me my 500 rubles. And the rich Jew, he says, what do you mean? You think I owe you 500 rubles? You owe me 500 rubles. For all those guests that we had, and all that money that we spent, I had to spend twice as much as your salary on all those poor people. So, Reb Feivel, Tzvi Adimelech's father, he realized that this rich man wasn't going to give him the 500 rubles, and he didn't have 500 rubles to give him back. So he just grabbed all of his things and left the house as quickly as he could. In the meantime, his wife, who was back home, didn't have a single penny. She was buying everything on credit, from the grocer, from the butcher, from the baker, the clothing store, everything that she needed, she was buying on credit, and everybody knew that her husband, Rev Feivel, was out teaching in the house of the wealthy Jew far away, and that he would come back with 500 rubles, which was more than enough to pay off all of her debts, and of course he would be there before Pesach. As it started getting closer to Pesach, all of the, the people who had lent Reb Feivel's wife and the mother of Reb Tzvi Melech money for all this time didn't want to lend her any money for Pesach. And she's starting to feel the squeeze. There's no more credit left. And of course, Reb Feivel knew this. And he thought to himself, how am I supposed to come home without any money? I've been away for six months and I have no money to come back with. What am I going to do? He got back home in the middle of the night and he was scared to go into the house because he had no money after being away for so long. So he went into the Beit Midrash, the house of study. Reb Svi Elimelech says, I was only seven years old then. I went in the morning to Davin and what do I see? My father, in the Beit Midrash. I said to him, Father, why didn't you come home? We miss you so much. You've been away for so long. And his father said, Ah, oh, my son, I just didn't want to wake you up. So Tzvi Ali Melech was seven years old. He ran back home to his mother. And he said, Father's home. And she was so happy. And Tzvi Ali Melech, he ran back to his father. And he told him, Listen, for four weeks we had nothing to eat. Because the butcher and the grocer and nobody trusted us anymore. They wouldn't extend us any credit. And now we went and told them, thank God that you're here and you have the money. So now mother is preparing the best breakfast for you. She already went and got eggs and she got meat and we're so happy that you came home. So Reb Feivel, 
He was there in the Beit Midrash davening Shachrit, and he davened for so long. He didn't know what to do. After he davened for hours, it took him an hour to pack up his tefillin and his talis. And the whole time he was saying, Shem, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? In the meantime, the seven-year-old Tzvi Elimelech, he says to his father, No, let's go home already. And so at some point he had to leave the Beit Midrash. They started walking in the street. At first he was walking so slow. One foot in front of the other. It was like they were made of cement. He couldn't move his feet. Finally, they came to the last corner before their house. And all of a sudden, a Cossack comes charging along on his horse. He stops right in front of my father. He says, I'm looking for Reb Fivel. My father looks up at the Cossack. No fear in his eyes whatsoever, even though Jews were very scared of Cossacks because the Cossacks were so cruel to the Jews. Reb Fivel says, that's me. The Cossack takes a little bag and he throws it at my father's chest. He hits my father's chest and he catches the bag before it falls. And when he looks back up, the Cossack was riding quickly into the distance. Reb Fivel, he opened the bag and he sees that it's pure gold coins. Gold coins made out of pure gold. So of course they had everything to pay off all of their debts. And they made a beautiful Seder. And Reb Tzvi Elimelech, who told the story, he said, That Seder night when my father opened the door for Ali Aonavi, I started yelling. And I said, Father, look, the Cossack is here again. The Cossack came to visit us again. My sweetest friends, when you're down, don't give up. Because Hashem will send you help. Sometimes it comes directly. And sometimes it comes through Ali Aonavi. May we all merit to see Eliyahu Navi, Elijah the prophet, at the Seder this year. Chag Sameach, my sweetest friends. Chag Sameach. <laughs> This is a story that took place around five years after the end of the Soviet Union, so around 1996. Everybody knows that Chabad Hasidis started in Russia. There was always the Tsar that caused problems for the Jews, but when the Soviet Union came about in 1922, the Lubavitcher Rebbe decided that it was a matter of life and death and that Jews had to be taught to be Jews, or they would be completely lost to Soviet culture. And the Rebbe was right, of course, because who knows how many Jews completely assimilated into the Soviet Union and no longer identify as Jews and no longer halachically Jews. But Chabad constantly pushed and pushed and pushed to keep Jews Jewish. So when the Soviet Union finally collapsed in 1991, Chabad was ready to start building Chabad houses and reaching out to Jews as quickly and as broadly as possible. Amongst the Hasidim that were reaching out to Jews was a young Chabad Hasid who had recently been ordained as a rabbi, received a smicha, and he together with other Chabad Hasidim were putting together a huge community seder in one of the towns in Russia. They were expecting hundreds of people to come to the seder, and they needed a big hall in order to make it. The mayor of the town was actually very enthusiastic. He had nothing against the Jews, and he loved that there was going to be a religious event because he was a devout Christian, and he recommended to the rabbi that the former Communist Party meeting hall would be the perfect place to do the Seder. You know, in a lot of places, the mosque or the church or the religious institution is normally the biggest building in the city. 
But when the communists were running the Soviet Union, they made sure that the biggest building in every town was the Communist Party meeting hall. And so there was no larger building in the entire town. The rabbi went there. He took a look at the building. And sure enough, it was perfect. Perfect space. So posters were put up. And people went out and invited other Jews personally. They bought food. And they started koshering. Of course, all the vessels had to be completely new or koshered like they were new. All the meat had to be strictly kosher. All of the cooking supervised all the time so that nobody would bring any chametz into the kitchen. And the building had to be cleaned from floor to floor, every single room. Every single nook and cranny had to be koshered and decorated for the Chag. And all that work paid off, because when the night of the Seder came, over 300 people arrived. (laughs) Both young and old, men and women, people dressed in their finest clothes, with big smiles on their faces. For some people, they hadn't been to a Seder in over 50 years. Others were just curious. Some came for a party. But everyone, whether they knew it or not, came because they were Jews, and it was Seder night. It took a while till everyone was seated at the tables and settled down, and then the rabbi made a little welcoming speech. Of course, he spoke in English, and it was translated into Russian. Haggadot were handed out. Of course, they were also translated into Russian. And cups of wine were filled. There was matzot, and the evening began. The rabbi explained along the way what was going on and what everybody needed to do, and there was a real feeling of joy in the room, something very special. Everyone agreed. They looked at one another and they said, something special is happening here. And they were very interested in everything the rabbi had to say. They went around and read aloud every passage in Russian while the rabbi would read it in Hebrew, and they learned about how Hashem did great miracles for the Jewish people thousands of years ago, how he took the Jews out of Egypt, They all ate matzah, they drank four cups of wine, they finished the meal, they sang, and they even danced at the end. And everything was going so great until they got to the cup of Elijah the prophet, Koshel Eliyahu. This is the extra cup of wine that's poured at the end of the meal to remind us that Elijah the prophet is going to come and announce the arrival of Mashiach. So the young rabbi enthusiastically explained how this fifth cup stood for Mashiach, who's going to come at any moment and gather all the Jews from all over the world, and bring them to Eretz Yisrael, and make a beautiful new world where everyone would see Hashem's presence. Suddenly, one of the older men stood up, and he tapped on the table. Everyone quieted down, and he said in a booming voice, Young man! Excuse me, please, young rabbi. So everybody quieted down more. Quiet, quiet, everyone, quiet. And then just like they had listened to the rabbi through the whole Seder, now everyone turned their heads to this old man to see what he had to say. The older man waited a few seconds, so everyone was quiet and paying attention. And then he said, Rabbi, we are very grateful to you for this beautiful evening, the wonderful food and wine. Everything is very nice. Very beautiful and very tasty. And everyone in the room was looking at one another and they all shook their heads in agreement. They wondered, what does this guy have to say? I mean, of course, everyone knows that. And the older man continued, Rabbi, everything you said was also very interesting, very nice. Beautiful stories, Rabbi. God took the Jews out of Egypt. He made miracles. Very nice biblical stories. We all love stories. But Rabbi... What you said about Mashiach coming and making a utopia and building the Holy Temple in Jerusalem and bringing all the Jews to the land of Israel? Please, Rabbi, we're grown-up people here. We're not little children that we believe in such nonsense. Now, Rabbi, you're a very nice man, and we're very grateful to you for everything you did for us. But please, Rabbi, save these foolish superstitions for your children but not for intelligent grown-ups like us. Please understand, Rabbi, please. This is nothing personal, but you're a very young and naive person. Obviously, you grew up in a bubble in the yeshiva, but we live in the real world, and we know better, Rabbi, than to believe nonsense like Mashiach. 
And everyone shook their heads in agreement. And then they looked at the poor rabbi as if to say, you know, sorry, rabbi, but the older man is right. But the young rabbi, he remained calm. He waited a few minutes before the older man sat down. And then he replied, my friend, the rabbi said with a big smile, my friends, he said with opened arms as he looked around the room, look at where we are. Do you realize where we are and what we're doing? Do you realize what you're saying? Everybody looked around the room. They had no idea what the rabbi was going on about. The rabbi continued, If someone would have told you just ten years ago that you would be making a Pesach Seder in the Communist Party meeting hall, would you ever have believed them for one second? Think about just ten years ago. There was nothing more powerful and secure than the Soviet Union and nothing weaker than Soviet Jews. Communism was the biggest enemy of God and everyone in Russia was sure that the communists were right. But here we are. The impossible has happened. Not only has communism fallen, but we have been able to transform the Communist Party meeting hall into a place for Jews to celebrate being taken out of Egypt and embrace our Judaism. So now tell me, is it so far-fetched to believe that Mashiach could come and change the entire world? And the man looked back at the crowd, and then at the young rabbi. He straightened his back, and he smiled. And he started clapping and he said, Bravo, Rabbi! Bravo! Bravo! And everyone broke out into applause. Bravo! Bravo. Bravo. And everyone realized that even though it was hard to believe, the truth is, Mashiach could come at any moment. And all we have to do is be ready for his imminent arrival. May it happen today that all the Jews are gathered together here in the Holy Land, in the Holy City of Jerusalem, and may we merit to see and feel Hashem's presence as it was in ancient times. Thank you so much for listening, my sweetest friends, as always. And when I say my sweetest friends, I really mean it. I really appreciate every single one of you, all of you that listen and share and contribute to this podcast. Thank you so much for being a part of this very special project. And I hope you're having a beautiful Chag, beautiful holiday. So until a week and a half from now, when I'll put out the next episode, Zaygazun, my sweetest friends, have a good Moed, Moadim Simcha. וחגים וזמנים לססון, and take care of yourselves. Bravo, bravo, bravo.